I'm going to hand over to Pierre Mansour to introduce Gaston. So Pierre. Thank you, Tim. Good evening, everyone. I certainly do have a glass of wine ready, and of course it's Chateau Musas. More on the glass or the vintage that's in uh, my glass later on. I am hugely excited to be bringing this live event to you this evening, albeit in circumstances that I, and I suppose all of us, were not necessarily expecting. Um, in fact, it was uh, this week that the Society was due to have a real event in London with a fantastic vertical of Chateau Musar. All the prep was done, so when things do return to normal, we will certainly be able to run that uh, event um, rather quickly. Thanks, though, to our digital world, we're able tonight to celebrate Lebanon's most famous winery in a slightly different way. But in many ways, that's so consistent with a wine that is unmistakable, remarkable, and different. Chateau Musar is a wine that has developed a cult following amongst Wine Society members, and one that I'm really proud to say has been listed by the Society for decades. I'm absolutely delighted that we are joined this evening directly from Lebanon, Managing Director, Head of Winemaking, and the third generation of the Muzar family, Gaston Hoshar. Gaston, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you tonight. I would like to thank the Wine Society for organizing this. As Pierre, you said, uh, we were supposed to have a tasting uh, two days ago last Monday. And unfortunately, due to the circumstances, it wasn't uh, possible to make it. So uh, we're replacing it by this uh, uh, session, this webinar tonight. Uh, I'm from home. Uh, I hope uh, we won't have any technical issues because in Lebanon, everything is possible. Uh, and uh, I know our time is limited, so uh, I, would not, I will not waste any more time, and I will go directly to the point. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, Chateau Musard is a company uh, which has been uh, over the world for a very long time. And uh, in fact, a lot of people uh, sometimes know where Lebanon is and sometimes do not. So um, I'm going to start a little bit about geography, talking about geography, putting us on a map, describing how is Lebanon, what is Lebanon, and then I will talk a little bit about the history, and then I will go into more details describing the company, the wines, etc. So first, a little bit of geography, as you can see, this is a small map of Europe with the Mediterranean Sea. So Britain is on the top left corner and Lebanon is on the bottom right corner. If you can see my ma the mouse just over here. This is a more close up map. So you can see Lebanon. It's uh, surrounded by the, the yellow line. Uh, it's a country which is quite small. It's 220 kilometers, so roughly 150 miles from north to south, and it's uh, 40 miles east to west. It's approximately rectangular shape. The capital Beirut is in the middle, it's there. And the winery is located in the city of Kazir, which is just here, overlooking the Junier Bay. Okay? This is the Mediterranean Sea, and as you can see, we have the Beka Valley, which I've surrounded in green, which is limited by two mountain chains. We have the first mountain chain, which is Mount Lebanon, which is over here, between the sea and the Beka. And then we have a second mountain chain, which is east of the Beka, which is Mount Anti-Lebanon, which is the border with Syria. And this is neighboring Syria, and this is Damascus. So you can see, you can see that uh, we're very close to a very hot spot of the world. And uh, this is the Golan Heights, which is another hot spot of the world. To come back to wine, uh, so we're located here. 
our vineyards located in the Beka are around this point. This I've taken from Google quite a long time ago. Uh, it shows you the elevation and you can see, so the sea, which is normally at zero meters altitude, Beirut, which is the red star, Mount Lebanon, which goes up to 3000 meters height. So here we have snow in the winter. We have snow from mid and December until mid of April. And we have some ski resorts where you can go and have fun. Uh, then the altitude goes back down to 1,000 meters height for the Beka Valley, which is more a plain, which is 10 kilometers wide approximately, so it's roughly seven miles, six to seven miles. And then we go back up to 2,500 meters, and that's the border with Syria. So that's the geography of Lebanon. And here we have, so those two mountain chains, which are left uh, east and west of the Beka Valley, which protects the valley from the humidity which comes from the west, from the sea. All the storms come from the west, and so all this humidity is partly stopped at the first mountain chain. And then we have the second mountain chain, which is also a barrier and protects the Beka from the heat of the desert which comes from Syria. Therefore, the Beka is a very good grape, a very good place to grow grapes. So to go back to now the history, so the company was created in 1930 by my grandfather. And I uh, fortunately uh, have the same name as him because in Lebanon, there's a, a habit. Uh, uh, the eldest son gives to his eldest son the name of his father. So my father, Serge, uh, as he was the eldest, gave me, because I'm the eldest, the name of his father, therefore my grandfather. So my grandfather created the company in 1930, coming back from a trip to France. He was sent there by his parents to go and study medicine. And uh, after one year, he didn't like it. He came back and he started producing wines. And he produced wines in a castle, which is from the 18th century which was called the Mzar, which is called the Mzar, and uh, which was owned at the time by, by his brother-in-law. And so uh, he started producing the wines there, and we were on the French mandate at the time. The French took over Lebanon after the First World War. So uh, he was selling uh, the majority of his wines to the French army in Lebanon. And so he wanted the French name, and so he called the wines Musar, which is uh, more French than Mzar. And he continued producing wines and selling them to the local market until the 50s, where uh, my father uh, joined the company in 1958, and he started producing the wines in 59. Uh, he produced the wines, he did a lot of tests, he changed a lot of uh, winemaking. And uh, during those years, beginning 60s, he went to Bordeaux. He studied enology with uh, Emile Penaud and uh, Ribeiro Gaillon. And so he became a winemaker. And he continued producing wines during the 60s and 70s. And uh, he was very uh, much uh, aware that the fruits and vegetables of Lebanon have very uh, important and were very characteristics and characteris characterized by their taste. And therefore, he started producing the wines since 1959 without any additives, without any sulfites. And uh, so uh, this is why from the wines from the 60s, not all the vintages do exist because not all were able to be produced as Chateau Musard wines, but more often as younger wines. And uh, so that's why we have the 60, 61, but we're missing 62, 63. We have the 64, we're missing 65, etc. Uh, in the beginning of the 60s also, his brother Ronald joined, and uh, he's still uh, today chairman of the company. And we were selling 
uh, all of our production in Lebanon, we were uh, a third of the local market with another big company having the two thirds. And uh, everything was going fine until 1975. In 1975, we had the war which broke out. And uh, what happened is the market collapsed. Therefore, we had to find other markets for our wines. So in 1979, we went to uh, the Bristol Wine Fair. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side had a small company in the UK, so he helped us uh, participate at that fair. And there, uh, a lot of wine writers, wine connoisseurs, tasted the wines, appreciated them. Michael Broadman was one of them also. And so we had very good reviews, very good press, and therefore we decided to start a company in the UK to be able to sell the wines there. The beginnings were difficult, but slowly sales grew. And uh, with the help of uh, the UK market, the UK customers, uh, sales grew and grew, and we had more and more demand all over the world. And uh, because Lebanon was still on the war, it was easier for us to ship our wines to the UK, and the UK became a very important hub for Musar worldwide. In 1984, the Decanter magazine, which I think you all know, uh, started their Man of the Year award, and the first Man of the Year was my father. We continued selling and exporting, and therefore in 1990, uh, it's a reference because it's the end of the war in Lebanon, of the so-called civil war, we were selling 97% of our production outside of Lebanon. So it was a huge turn around during those 15 years from selling nearly everything locally to nearly everything abroad. Now, when the war finished, we knew that we had to come back on our local market and we did some effort. And today we roughly export 85% of our production. So we sell locally 15%. I joined the company in 1994, and um, my cousin, Ronald's son, joined in uh, 2000. My brother, Mark, joined in 2010. And just for your information, we're still a family business. Uh, it's still controlled 100% by the family with no outside shareholders. This is a picture of our uh, barrel area. So in the mid 50s, the Mzar castle was too small, beginning to be too small for production, which was increasing. And therefore, my grandfather bought a place which is 50 meters away, 30 yards away. And he built the winery uh, on top and around this very old house, which was there, which is today more than 250 years of age, with those very nice arches. Uh, some figures, uh, because uh, presentation needs figures, unfortunately. Uh, we have uh, 200 hectares of vines. We produce an average of 700,000 bottles per year. 75% of it is red, 15% is white, 5% is rosé, and 5% is arak, which is our local drink in Lebanon, which is a spirit, so distilled from grape alcohol with aniseed. As I said, export represent 85% of the production, and the yield range of our uh, vineyards is between 50 to 30 hectoliters per hectare, depending on the vintages, depending on the grape varieties, depending also on the vineyards. The picture you can see is the Bacchus Temple. The Bacchus Temple is, uh, was built by the Romans 2,000 years ago. It's uh, probably the biggest uh, temple to the wine of God built anywhere in the Roman Empire. And they built it in Baalbek. Baalbek is a city which is north of the Beka Valley. And uh, they built this temple probably because at the time, Lebanon was known in the Middle East to be a very uh, good place to grow uh, everything which was agriculture, especially the Beka Valley. And so this temple was built. Just, just to give you an idea about the size of this, each column is made of three pieces and each piece is eight meters height. So the height of this uh, small building that you see in front of you is 24 meters, just the columns. Uh, the base is probably uh, around three, four meters height. 
maybe even more five or six. Uh, so uh, uh, it gives you just a size of the building, an idea about the size. Uh, I'm going now to present a little bit the vineyards. So our vineyards are located in the BK, while in fact 90% of our vineyards are in the BK. We grow most of our grapes there. The BK is at 1,000 meters above sea level. And as I've said, it's protected from the east and the west by those two mountain chains. All our production of red grapes is located in the BK. However, for the white grapes, part of them are uh, planted in the BK, and uh, these grapes are the white grapes which produce our entry-level white. The other white grapes that we have are uh, grown on uh, Mount Lebanon slopes and Mount Anti-Lebanon slopes, so on both slopes, on the west and east of the Bekaa. And uh, those vineyards are at 1,200 meters altitude, so a bit higher. Therefore, the harvesting of those grapes, of those whites, happen after the harvesting of the Bekaa. Regarding the soils, the soils are very different from one place to another. There are a lot of calcareous soils. They're silty, they're gra gravelly, and all of those have a limestone base because it's mountains. Uh, this gives you an idea about our vineyards. You have a vineyard in the village of Anna, another one in the village of Kifraya, which are the two villages where we have our, our vineyards. And then I just wanted to show you a small picture with some vineyards with a bit of snow because every year we have two or three weeks of snow in our vineyards. So this will show you that uh, we are a country where we have a Mediterranean climate and uh, we have a lot of uh, water, underground water tables, so we don't need to irrigate. Now, to come back to the Chateau Red, and start discuss discussing a little bit about the wines. I uh, was just checking the time here. Um, so our Chateau Red, as you probably all know already, because if you're attending, you know already the wines. I hope so. Uh, it's a blend of three varietals, which are Senso, Carignan, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the harvesting of these grapes start end of August, and it finishes end of September. We bring in the grapes by truck, from the Beka to the winery, and uh, we put these grapes after uh, stemming and, and uh, crushing and destemming. We put them in concrete vats where the wine starts to ferment naturally. We don't add yeast, it's the wild yeast which is on the skins of the grapes which develop and do start the fermentation. The fermentation takes approximately seven to ten days, and then we have a wine which has finished its fermentation which we leave on the skins and the seeds to get additional uh, extract, additional color, additional taste. And this maceration period can go for a period from a couple of days to two, three weeks, depending on the wine, depending on its characteristic. It's by taste that we decide uh, when we need to rack it. It then spends six to nine months in concrete. It does its malolactic, and then it goes into oak. We put our Chateau Red in oak for one year, and it's French oak barrels from the region of Nevers. Once the oak aging is finished, we bring back the wine into concrete, and we do the blending of the different varieties before bottling the wine at the end of its third year. Following this, the wine is settled, stored in our cellars for four years before being released during its seventh year. So uh, I've put here a small picture about our uh, cellar. This is the cellar of our old wines. So we, this door is here open, but usually it's closed and we don't go there often, maximum once every three months to get another bottle. So all the wines which are before the 70s are in this, uh, this room. Uh, behind the camera, there's a long corridor of approximately uh, 10 yards, 15 meters. Uh, another white uh, of Chateau Musar, another wine of Chateau Musar is, is its white, which is uh, quite awkward to taste. It's a very difficult wine. Uh, it's a blend of two local grapes, 
which are Obeide and Meruah. Uh, this wine has been produced for a very long time. We have vintages going back to the 50s. And at the time, it was produced only from Meruah grape. We only had a vineyard of Meruah. And the Meruah and Obeide grapes are grapes which have been in Lebanon for more than 6,000 years. Phoenicians used to produce white wines out of these grapes, and they used to sh sh produce it, ship it, and sell it to pharaohs, to Assyrians, so to Egypt and to Iraq, to Mesopotamia. Uh, they used to ship it in amphoras. So uh, wine production in Lebanon is not something new. Uh, grapes have been there for a very long time. And uh, it is believed that uh, the Phoenicians growing the grapes uh, in Lebanon shipped the wines, then also shipped the grapes, shipped the vines to their different counters around the Mediterranean. Then when the Greeks invaded, they took part of the grapes. Then the Romans came and they took part of the grapes too. And this is probably how the vine spread through Europe from its southern part. So to come back to this wine, it's a blend of, since 1989, of these two local grapes, Obeide and Meruah. We have, were the first, of, the first uh, producers using local varieties to produce the white wine. The harvesting of these whites, as I said, the vineyards are in the mountains, so we harvest in October. It's fermented directly into oak barrels, French oak. Still no additives, nothing. The yeast is naturally on the, with the grapes. The wine is aged in oak barrels for nine months. Then we blend the two varieties and we bottle it, and then we release it to the market seven years later. This white wine is fine because to avoid having uh, tartaric acid when you put the wine in the fridge. However, our Chateau Red and all our red wines are not fine and not filtered. Okay. Uh, this is a storage of the winery. So we have, as I said, we have four years of current vintage, six, seven years of uh, current vintage of whites. Therefore, we have uh, uh, quite uh, important uh, number of bottles laying down. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have just uh, seen the release of a book on Chateau Musard. Uh, it's a book which was uh, published by Académie du Vin Library. Uh, it uh, talks a lot about the history of the wines, the history of the family, the way we produce the wines, how we've been producing it during all those years. And uh, we have some uh, very important uh, persons who have also contributed and have done their uh, comments uh, inside that book. And so this is now available uh, online because of confinement. We were supposed also to do the launch in April, which was not possible. It will be done uh, soon, but the wine, this book is already available. Um, Pierre, uh, I think uh, it's time now if you want to talk a little bit about the wine, if you want to uh, taste something. Yes. I've opened, I've opened myself a bottle of 2013, which is in front of me. Uh, it's here. There. It's empty because I did pour it in a decanter. I did my job. And I have a glass here, which is uh, to say cheers and thank you for hosting me, hosting Chateau Musar. And uh, well. Uh, cheers, Gaston. Thank you, too. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the 2013? It's a vintage that we have just released at the Wine Society uh, today, actually. It's the, the new vintage of the 2013, and it, it's uh, the second time I've tried it, but I'd love to have uh, hear your comments. How did you, um, how do you see the style of the 2013 vintage compared to the 2012? Uh, you know, uh, Chateau Musard is known to having its wines uh, uh, which are very different from vintage to vintage. Uh, we don't have a consistency in the taste uh, and uh, it's not done on purpose, but it's done logically. 
Uh, why? Because as I've said, we produce our wines without additives. Fermentation is natural. Therefore, each wine takes its path. And depending on the climatic conditions of each year, each vintage do get, uh, does get a certain character which it develops. And uh, the 2013 is not different. Uh, it has its own character. It's still uh, quite uh, young. It's very fruity, very red, dark red fruits. Um, I have here, uh, if you want, uh, I can put on my screen, I've prepared the tasting notes. So uh, we can read through them, but it's not really important. For all our viewers, these are uh, available uh, from our website. You can download them. So uh, you have uh, an overview of the harvest, a little bit about the winemaking. So the fermentation that year went uh, quite easily. We didn't have to cool down too much the process of fermentation. Fermentation is a process which usually delivers a lot of heat. So you have to cool it down because heat kills the yeast. So this went uh, very easily. And we have a wine which has a lot of uh, rich character. It's, uh, it's very strong, it's very, um, how can you say this? Uh, Rand. Very soft at the same time. It's concentrated, uh, it has a lot of body, and uh, it's a wine which will have a lot of potential for, I think, for aging. Uh, it's not very tannic, on the contrary, the tannins are more quite uh, supple, soft. Uh, but uh, the density of the swine makes that it has a lot of, uh, well, I hope, uh, a nice future in front of it. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I, I find it absolutely gorgeous. I think the thing that, I, uh, that, that strikes me about the 2013 is that as soon as you pull the cork and pour the wine, um, the aromatic, the perfume is incredibly um, expressive much more so than, than I'm used to with Muzar at this youthful stage. And um, I find the, the, the richness, as you said, it, is there. It's got lovely silky tannins. And although it's young, I think it will bring a lot of pleasure to, to people who like to drink their wines at the sort of younger end of the, of the spectrum. Um, but I, I think it's delicious, uh, really, really lovely uh, wine and um, showing incredibly well. It has lovely elegance as well. Yeah, it's very fine. It has a nice, it, it doesn't hit you uh, in the punch. It's not aggressive. On the contrary, it's very elegant. It's, uh, it's smooth. Um, it's, it's a wine which at the, at the same time has a lot of presence. It's mouthful, it fills the, the palate, it fills the palate completely, but without being uh, uh, harsh, uh, yes. without having rush tannins. Uh, and therefore, yeah, it's, uh, it can be uh, drunk uh, very nicely now, definitely. But I think in three, five years, it will uh, open up uh, tremendously and we'll have uh, something which is uh, maybe more enjoyable. What one of the benefits of, of being at home and trying this wine is that I don't have spittoons, so I have to swallow the wine. So cheers, I'm enjoying it very much. I think perhaps we're now ready to uh, take some questions, which Tim will be, I believe, will be um, coordinating. Is that right, Tim? Yes, that's right, Pierre. And we've had a lot of questions come through, so I do apologise for those that we can't, can't get to. Um, but Gaston, we've had a lot of questions asking when should I open a particular vintage and obviously we can't go through every vintage, but uh, is there a general rule of thumb for how long you do recommend? Uh, well, uh, it's a very difficult and tricky question. Uh, so uh, from our experience, uh, we know that our wines are not suitable before they're released because they're still too young. When they're released, as your uh, members will see they will be able to taste 2013 in a week, a month or uh, three months. They can taste now the 2012, which is still very young. And uh, the wines are drinkable from seven years onwards. However, however, they tend to develop a lot of characters during the first five years. 
And therefore, uh, we have realized that uh, tasting the Musard after 10 years or 12 years uh, makes that the wine becomes much more complex. And so this is what we recommend. But this doesn't mean that it's uh, okay for everyone because as you know, uh, wine is a question of taste and the taste of each and every one of you listening here tonight uh, is different. And therefore, some of you will prefer their wines a bit younger. Some of them will prefer them a little bit older. It's a question of palate. It's a question of experience. It's a question of uh, uh, acquaintance with the wine. Uh, so there's no real uh, time limit. Uh, we know from past experience that our wines have this huge capacity of aging. They were not made like that at the start. This is something that my father realized after 20 years. When he was at the Bristol Wine Fair and that he showed 59, he realized that the wine of 20 years was still very young. And so this is where he realized that what, we had, what he had produced could uh, live uh, quite some, for quite some time. Um, so uh, tasting a wine is uh, something where you can, let's say, buy a case of 12. Now our cases are sixes, but they used to be 12s. Uh, you can taste a bottle every year, and so you see how the wine can improve. And this is very good. Unfortunately, as the time passes and you see that the, after one year, the taste is still improving. So you keep the remaining, then you taste it again, and then it keeps improving, but it can, comes at the end to a plateau. And uh, so for some, it can be a plateau. For others, it continues aging. For some, uh, it will be less interesting. For others, it will be more interesting because the character of the wine will change. We have more tertiary notes. And uh, some people might like this, these notes. So we can say that the wine is still living and others might not like them. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to give uh, uh, just a blunt answer to a question like that. But what we know is our wines don't die after two, three years. They tend to have this ability to age at least 40, 50 years. If they're stored in good conditions and if uh, the cork, which is a natural product, is able to stand time. Of course. And Gaston, the other question that we're seeing repetit repetitively is how to enjoy the wine. Uh, how long before opening should it be done? And also some questions about the corks and what corks yeah. could, could be used. Okay. So, uh, we used to, to uh, have our wines uh, closed with a cork which used to have a certain dimension. And uh, we've realized this time that uh, the dimensions did pose problems. And this was the standard dimension which was used at the time. And what has happened lately is since I think 2012, we decided to change the dimension of our corks. We used to have corks of 49 millimeters of height, and uh, we decided to reduce this to 45. And we used to have corks of 24 millimeters in diameter, and we did increase the diameter to 25. Now, why did we do all this? We did all this for a reason. Uh, today's cork screws are good, but unfortunately, they're not long enough. And a lot of customers do, uh, or drinkers, do uh, use a corkscrew, insert half of it, try to pull the cork out. And unfortunately, if the cork doesn't go through all the way and does uh, get to the other side of the cork, when you're pulling the cork out, the corkscrew is ex it's putting a pressure on the cork to being pulled out, while the cork itself is pushing on the sides. By pushing on the sides, uh, it's trying to stick to the glass. And therefore, if you're only pushing half of the cork because you haven't inserted the corkscrew fully, then this part could come off and a part of the cork could stay in the bottle. And this is one of the big problems that a lot of the uh, consumers have faced. And this is why we reduced the, uh, the size, the length of the cork so that uh, all cork screw could be inserted completely without any issues. Yes, the second I, bit, yes. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I think I've never heard that story from a wine producer, and I am. It's it's making me glow because 
I couldn't agree with you more that corkscrews today, the majority of corkscrews that are sold, uh, certainly in the UK, they do have their, the, the screw is too short. So when you have longer corks, it always causes a problem unless you have a really good um, traditional corkscrew. Um, so a delight to hear that you're adapting your closure in order to make it easy for the wine drinker. That's all I wanted to say. Carry on. Sorry to interrupt. Well, well, thank you, because you're confirming what we've been uh, uh, having uh, with the market for the last years. And so we, what we did do is to also to make sure that the closure uh, was not going to lack age. We did increase its, its density. How do you increase the density of a cork? We increase the diameter. So when you squeeze it in the bottle, the density is more important. And therefore, if you can see the, your, the cork of the 2013, it's a bit shorter than the vintages of 2010 and 11. And, uh, but it's also uh, a cork which is denser. And therefore, we are able to, uh, for us, have a cork which has uh, the same uh, lifespan. Uh, another reason uh, why uh, we did shorten the corks to 45 is you need to know that this is a technical question. The Bordelais bottle and all the bottles, the neck of the bottles is normalized. There's a standard. And the standard gives you uh, dimensions with a plus or minus. And it gives the dimension to the neck of the cork from the top down to 45 millimeters. After this 45 millimeters inside the neck, the dimension of the bottle is not normalized. There's no standard. So the neck can be much wider or, um, and usually you have a bit like something which goes much wider after 45 millimeters, which makes that if you have long corks, you might have a, a weakness between the cork and the glass because the cork is not tight enough on the glass to make a closure if you have uh, changes of slight changes of temperatures of movement of everything so it makes the, the the bottle a bit weak and so this was also one of the reasons why we diminished this to 45 millimeters now what i would like also to say is there is a tool which not a lot of people know about but which we've been using a lot for our older vintages which is called which is called called uh, uh, Prongs. And this is what is the prong. And this allows you to pull out any cork of nearly any length with no issues at all. Now, uh, why do I show this? Because for people who have corks above or vintages above 12 or 15 years, uh, they might face different issues with our corks. We explained this in a video which we've put online, which my brother has done at the winery, uh, showing how we can use prongs to open bottles, what is their use, and uh, how to use them, and why to use them. Uh, they're very practical, and they're very easy to use, and uh, you, can go, you can take out nearly every cork with this. Uh, some corks are still, even with this, you might face some problems if they are loose. And then you can use a mix of a normal corkscrew and this, these prongs. But uh, uh, these could take you out any, nearly of any situation. Thanks, Gaston. And with decanting, I know that you actually also recommend decanting your white as well as your red. So just yes. a general rule of thumb for the length of time on decanting. Uh, so, um, decanting is a process which uh, you normally use to aerate a wine. Uh, at Musar, decanting has a double purpose. First, we aerate it because our wines have a tendency, uh, as they age, and because of the very low levels of sulfites, the wine do tend to close. So, uh, our wines have uh, need oxygen. Uh, whatever their age, whatever the vintage, they need oxygen to be able to show, to be able to express their characters. And therefore, decanting the wine it is a must. Uh, when you open a, vint a vintage which is above 20 years of age, let's say uh, 98 and older or 99 and older, uh, you are faced with a smell 
which sometimes can put you off. Uh, the smell is a bit of rotten, rotten cabbage, a bit of mustiness, a bit of uh, mushroomy. Uh, I'm not talking about a corked bottle. I'll get to cork in a minute. Uh, I'm talking about bottles which have age. And this smell will disappear after five minutes in a decanter. Uh, it will definitely disappear. It need, but you need a decanter because the wine needs oxygen. Uh, if a wine uh, smells awkward when you open it, it must not be thrown. Uh, one small uh, story that I have is around 12, 15 years ago, we were at Christmas and uh, we had uh, foie gras. And my father went down to his cellar on the 25th of December in the morning and he took a bottle of white wine. He opened that bottle, he smelled it, he decanted it, he put it aside. He went up, continued doing things. He came back two hours later, uh, smelled it again, didn't like the smell, opened the second bottle, which he poured for lunch. <laughs> the first bottle he kept on as aside. And uh, in fact, uh, the next day, uh, there was still a piece of foie gras left. So he was proposed this for dinner. He was offered this for dinner. And he remembered that there was still this bottle of wine in the decanter in his cellar. So he went down, he smelled the bottle, and in 24 hours, the bottle had been cooked. So although our wines uh, tend to have very odd smells at start, uh, specifically for older vintages, uh, they do tend to open up. And so uh, leaving a wine for 24 hours is not something which is uh, unfeasible at all. Um, I decanted this bottle uh, half an hour ago, and I think now it should be smelling uh, quite well. All the vintages would need, uh, as the wine ages, as it would need more time. Now, you can decant a vintage if you want to taste it at a point in time with dinner, but if you want to enjoy a bottle and you want to taste all its characters, let's say for four hours during the whole evening, decant the wine just to remove the sediments, because this is the second reason why we need to decant Mizar is to remove the sediments, to avoid having cloudy wines in the glass. And so you remove the sediments, you decant it, and then you pour a big glass, and then you have a small sip every five minutes, and this glass will show all the characters that Musa can give with all the evolution that the wine will pass through. And uh, you can uh, enjoy your glass of wine for uh, two, three, four hours, uh, but you need to slip it very slowly, <laughs> to sip it very slowly, if it's possible. Uh, I opened uh, for the visit of uh, MWs to Lebanon last May, a bottle of 74. Uh, I opened it on a Thursday. They tasted it on that Thursday, uh, but I had opened two bottles for them, but they only tasted one. So the second bottle was left for me and I took it home. And I poured it to guest nine days later, not the next Saturday, two days later, the following Saturday, nine days later. And the bottle was amazing. So a bottle of wine, uh, I didn't uh, close it with uh, removing the air. I didn't do anything. I just put the cork back in and it was on the top in the kitchen. So not even in the fridge. Uh, therefore, uh, yeah, our wines can age. Uh, you just need them to you need to give them time if you're able to not taste them early. <laughs> Always a, easier said than done sometimes. <laughs> so we're actually going to now turn to a member to ask a question. So Nick Cooper has a question on the style of wine and how it may have changed over time. So Nick, can you hear us? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, yes, I had a question about the style of your Chateau Red. And I just wondered if um, the style has altered in the past decade, either because of climate changes or by design. And if so, in what way? I know each vintage is quite different, but just, you know, if there was a general style change over, over the last decade. OK. Uh, so uh, I said uh, earlier that my father had changed the style when he joined the winery in 59. And in fact, it took him 20 years working with the varieties that he had, which were 
Food Choix, Cabernet Sauvignon, Carignan, and Sanso to produce uh, what is the bending we have today. And uh, the, if you want, the recipe or the way of producing the wines from 77 has stayed the same. Uh, so late 70s, 80s, 90s uh, were wines which were produced in the same way. Uh, in 1995, uh, I had just arrived at the winery and my father was, I, I was just looking over the wines. I wasn't uh, uh, making them or anything. And uh, my father had a 95 vintage and uh, the vintage was great. And therefore they, he has a couple of bats which he didn't want to touch. And so uh, the 1995 was quite extreme. And when, when it was launched in 2002, 2003, it was a very difficult uh, vintage to taste. And so we launched at the same time, 1996. Uh, 95 was quite rejected. Uh, 95 has proven afterwards that it was better than all the other vintages which are close in the years um, because it was so extreme. But it took time to get become ready. Uh, so after this 95 vintage, where the VA has shot up to very high levels, we decided that the VA level, which is uh, at Muzar quite important, should be uh, reduced very slightly to become under a certain threshold. We used to have our VAs which would be between 0 0.75 to 0 0.85. And in fact, we decided to reduce this uh, from the middle of the 90s to be, be between 0 0.75, 0 0.80. So become below the barrier of 80, where uh, off, above this barrier, the VA is a bit too expressive and sometimes can be uh, seen as negative, although in the long run, it's a positive. But in the short run, it might be seen as a negative. And therefore, uh, this is one of the things we've done with the wines. But it's so slight that it's not really noticeable. Yes. Uh, the, the other thing is uh, you have the... Uh, climate change, which is really affecting uh, the grapes, affecting the vineyard, the vines, the grapes, and therefore all the process and the taste. And we uh, have been uh, forced to bring forward the date at which we start harvesting because the grapes were maturing a bit earlier. Uh, so uh, this might have had an impact on the style of the wine, but it's not something uh, we can do anything about. So. Uh, we have to go with the flow. And in fact, uh, we uh, do harvest uh, when the grapes are matured. And therefore, if it's earlier, it's earlier. If it's later, it's later. And it's worth just saying um, for those who uh, are less familiar with, with VA that Gaston is referring to, VA stands for volatile acidity. And that is a kind of, uh, it's a sort of form of oxidation uh, that occurs in the wine, but it's uh, a form of oxidation that is controlled and can enhance a wine. And it certainly can enhance wines that are made in more Mediterranean climates. Uh, VA will give the wine a certain lift and a complexity. Um, and so that, um, that was something that was very present in the 95 vintage. Um, and I it still exists, Gaston, but perhaps in a more balanced uh, form um, than, than yeah. previously. So I think it's very much part of the move, our signature, uh, that, that volatile acidity. Definitely, uh, the VA, the volatile acidity, is part of the Musar style. Uh, the thing is, we try to uh, control it a bit more so that it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, and uh, we think that our wines should be balanced, should be harmonious. So a certain level of PA is needed, but without being too obvious so that it doesn't put off uh, the wine. Uh, and therefore, this is how we've been patrolling this uh, character. Thank Thanks, you. Gaston. A couple of questions about uh, the great plantings and great varieties that you have. Are you replanting many and are you introducing any new varieties into your 
current mix? Okay, uh, so uh, we have uh, new plantings, yes. Uh, we are developing vineyards uh, continuously, but small uh, areas, not very big areas, because it's difficult to find big areas of plantings in Lebanon. Uh, our mix is not going to change. The Chateau Mizar has such a signature and has such a follow up and follow so many followers that we can't change the style or the the character of the wine so this is going to change not this is going to stay the same so it's we're going to stay a blend of senso carignan and cabernet sauvignon uh, the developments of new vineyards is sometimes to replace older older ones which don't produce any more grapes or to increase a little bit the capacity of the winery for uh, younger wines Apart from Chateau Mizar, uh, I don't know if your members know, but we have other products. We have the Rocher Perifis, which what the Wine Society carries. We also have a younger wine, which is called Mizar Jeune. Uh, and therefore, uh, for these wines, we need other grape varieties too, apart from Senso. Uh, we have some uh, Syrah, which goes in the Mizar Jeune. We have some Grenache, which is specific to the Rocher Perifis. And we have some Mourved, which is specific to the Rosé. So these are the six varieties which we have in the Beka Valley. Uh, apart from this, in the Beka, we've planted also uh, some uh, white varieties, which we use for our uh, entry-level white wine, which are Chardonnay, Viognier, and Vermentino. Uh, and we are now also planting uh, new vineyards of whites of Obeida and Merouah to have uh, the consistency and the quantities of the Chateau Whites because uh, the older uh, and local indigenous grape varieties of Obeida and Merouah, the vineyards are so old that the vines are dying. So we have been uh, planting new vineyards of those two grape varieties. Wonderful, thank you. Now I believe David Peters has a question on the yields that you mentioned. So David, we're going to unmute you if you'd like to ask us on your question. Yeah, um, my question is um, with regards to the yields um, that you have um, from the vineyards. They're quite low. Um, I seem to recall it was around 15 to 30 hectolitres. Um, I just wanted to understand whether that's your decision as a winemaker or whether that's something that's actually um, determined by somebody else. Uh, so uh, these... Uh uh, yields are low for uh, several reasons. First, we prune short uh, the Senso and the Carignan because these are varieties which give a lot of production. Uh, these varieties exist in southern France and they've been producing rosés and they have, uh, they can give very high yields of uh, 50, 60, even more 80 hectoliters per hectare very easily. But then you don't have a wine which has the character, the concentration that our, uh, our wines have. Uh, in southern France, they're used to produce uh, uh, more rosé wines, so they want something very easy. For us to be able to put uh, these uh, grape varieties in the, our wines, we need a certain concentration, we need, we need to have character, and therefore the Senso and the Carignan are pruned a little bit short to get this concentration. Uh, so that's the, the main reason. Uh, now, uh, if we, we've realized that we can go a little bit higher than 15 to 30, I think we can go up to 25, or even to, uh, from 25 to 35, 40, uh, keeping the concentration. The thing is, in the last uh, seven, 10 years, there has been so many hiccups with weather that it's been nearly impossible to bring uh, the yields higher. We've had some uh, heat uh, waves. We've had some some years some hail. Uh, sometimes uh, heat waves during uh, the blossoming. Sometimes heat waves during the maturation. And therefore, we've always in the last five years we've lost uh, ten or fifteen percent of the crop every vintage. If you compare this to an average year, uh, so uh, yeah, our yields are low. And it's a choice, and at the same time, the weather is also making it uh, smaller, smaller. 
So we, <clears throat> thank you, Gatlin. The next question was going to be for Mr. Davies, but I don't know if we can just find him at the moment. So I might ask on his behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question was, for such a celebrated wine with such a cult following, how are you able to keep the price to such great value for money? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, the price is uh, what it is because um, you have customers and not all of our customers have the, unfortunately, the purchasing power, you know, uh, uh, the the taste of a wine our wine is very tasty it's very specific it's not uh, normal uh, easy to drink uh, or a famous wine region let it be french or american or australian or whatever italian or spanish uh, south african uh, you name it uh, so uh, we're a wine from lebanon so not everybody uh, understand this we have followers, yes, we have a lot of followers all around the world. We export to more than 50, 60 countries. But the people who taste us are people who are, people who are really amateurs. They know the wines, they know their palate, and uh, we are not known to uh, the, everyone in the street. Uh, we're not, uh, if you want, a brand which is, we're worldwide known, but only to people who know their palate. Uh, and we produce wines in Lebanon and we think that we deserve much more for the quality of the wine than the prices we have. Uh, but we're trying to keep our followers and not everyone has the means of buying a bottle of wine at around uh, 30 pounds, which is the price in the UK. And therefore, uh, yeah. Uh, it's still at that price. We know that we would deserve more, but if we, let's say, put it at 40 pounds instead of 30 pounds, I'm not sure we'll sell as many bottles, so the quantities would be reduced. It could be a choice, but until today, we think that it's not the right choice. Uh, we want to have Musar spread all over, and so this is the choice we've taken. And I think, and made. to add to that, Gaston, I would say that's exactly why this is a wine that has consistently been listed by the Wine Society, has been consistently bought by members because you have always, as a family, had a very, very pragmatic approach to how you position the wine in the market. And um, may that continue. I think it's, uh, you know, and, and a very modest approach as your modest explanation just, just gave. So, you know, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm saying that representing all of the Wine Society membership uh, because there are certain parts of the world where the bottle prices have become signatures to the wines rather than uh, a reflection of the quality that the wine represents. Uh, but that's another story. Well, thank you, Pierre. You put it very nicely. So <laughs> thank you very much. So, Gaston, that does bring us to seven o'clock. We still have a lot of questions that we haven't been able to get to. But, Pierre, would you like to just wrap things up and then I'll just finish with one quote from a, from a member which I'd like to share with Gaston after. Sure, of course. Um, so, uh, this has been fantastic. I, I, I can't believe how many messages I've been seeing pop up on the screen in front of me from the participants. Um, and I have to say, the number of different vintages that of Chateau Mousse are that have been opened during this last hour in the UK. I think we had around um, uh, 550, maybe 600 participants at, at, at the sort of peak time. Um, and so I think a lot of Chateau Mousse was drunk this evening right across vintages. There was even a couple of messages from, um, I think his name was Bob, uh, forgive me if it wasn't Bob, but I saw it pop up that he was actually at the Bristol Fair and tasted the 1979. And I think that's just, just incredible to, to sort of bring us to, to, to the full uh, circle. I want to just mention the book that you meant, that you talked about Gaston. Uh, I read it, uh, I've read it over the last few days, the Musar book that celebrates the 90th anniversary. It's beautifully written. 
uh, beautifully produced. Um, and I'm delighted that the Academy Duvan, who uh, published the book, they've offered Wine Society members a, a discount, which I guess, Tim, we can, can, do we have a means of sending that detail to the participants of the event today? Yes, so anyone that registered to attend this evening's tasting will be emailed a link uh, with the details of that, of that discounted price. Uh, so with, along with a recording in case anyone wasn't able to watch the whole, the whole session. Great, that's good. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely book, absolutely lovely book. The 2013 vintage is, is available now to order as well. We've got stock uh, that's coming into our warehouse next week, but it's available to purchase from our website now uh, in cases of six. Um, and um, by all means, um, well, I can recommend it. I've nearly finished my glass. I've got to pace myself because Gaston and I have to do this event again uh, in about an hour's time. Um, uh, finally, uh, Gaston, a huge thanks. I think that with your wines, with the Mouzard wines, they always create so much conversation. And wine is so much about socializing and being with people and uh, conversation. And, and your wines always excite, always entice. And uh, it was fascinating to hear about the history, fascinating to see some of the, the pictures in your presentation. And, and thank you again. I know it's quite late there in Lebanon um, at the moment. You're a few hours ahead of us. Thanks very much for, for spending uh, your time with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. And thank you to Tim. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to the Wine Society. And thank you to the members for attending, because if we didn't have the members, there wouldn't be a webinar. Uh, wine is something which is really against dist distanciation, which is what we are forced to do today. Uh, wine is something which uh, talks about time, which talks about age, which talks about memories, which brings back memories. It's uh, something where you um, can uh, release the pressure, you can show your feelings, and uh, therefore, it's, um, I think it's a positive thing. So uh, enjoy and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Gaston. Thank you, Gaston. Cheers. Thank you. Now, if any members would like to carry on the conversation, we encourage you to head to our members online forum, the community. Again, we will email you a link to that. Already, the Chateau Musa thread is by far the most popular thread on, on the community. Uh, which just speaks volumes for the, for the popularity of the wine and the, the level of conversation that it does spark. Uh, but in uh, preparation for this event, we received one email from a member who was going to be joining us. And I just thought I'd share that with you, Gaston, because he, met, he says, please pass on my warmest thanks to Mr. Hoshar for all the joy his family has brought to mine. I think that sums it up lovely. Uh, That's very nice. Thank you very uh, so much. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, I do hope all the members enjoyed it. Certainly seeing the chat, it looks as though they have. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on these shores uh, as soon as we can get you back over to have a tasting as opposed to an event. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Gaston. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Pierre. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.